So in addition to um, the acknowledgement of our special guests, um, I just would like to share words of appreciation for all the Trojan leaders that are here this afternoon. You're providing inspiration during these challenging times, and we appreciate you and value your work on behalf of students and the communities you serve. Irving R. Malbo would have called you champions of change, and Dean Pedro Noguera calls you agents of impact. So thank you, all of you, for what you do. Dean Malbo served as dean here um, from 1953 until 1973. And in honor of his leadership of the School of Education, an endowed chair was established in his honor. And he was the first holder of the chair as dean emeritus from 1974 to 1975. So for this inaugural lecture, let's look back at our history and learn about a distinguished leader whose bronze plaque welcomes you every time you enter White Phillips Hall, the tallest building on campus, as it should be for education. His words remind us that our goal is to develop standards to which others will aspire in the field of education. The future is a world limited only by ourselves. Let's watch. Irving Malbaugh had a vision, and the overall vision was to produce outstanding educational leaders. That it was always in his mind. And asking the question, how can it best be done? Irving Malbo joined the USC faculty in 1939 and served as Dean of the Education School from 1953 to 1973. He first met Robert Ferris in 1962. He was very personal, but you could tell that he was a person of convictions and that he was a person of accomplishment. Irving was a person who established a strong program for practitioners. Dean Melbo pioneered the scientific study of administrative leadership skills and helped create standards for almost all facets of school administration. I think uh, his uh, biggest accomplishments would, would be, number one, the establishment of a network, which is the envy of many, many universities and is one of the reasons why students come to USC. Secondly, I would say his blending of research and practice and hiring practitioners to teach. The third one would probably be the building of Wade Phillips Hall, which was a huge endeavor. Under Dean Melbo's leadership, the School of Education's faculty tripled in size, and student and faculty research had a tremendous impact on educational practices. I would hope that, that everybody would always remember Irving Melbo doing the types of things at the School of Education that allowed it to be a prominent location for people who want to be successful school leaders. I'm very proud to be an alum of the University of Southern California and the Rosser School of Education. It continues to produce outstanding school administrators and leaders. The current faculty, the current leadership, the kinds of programs that are being offered will do nothing but make the Rosser School of Education even greater than what it is now. And it's going to continue to be a very exciting time. Connecting us with our history, um, so important. So many individuals have held the Malbo chair, and I would like to acknowledge my predecessor, Dr. Rudy Castorita, who was unable to be here today. Rudy, we send you words of appreciation for the time as the chairholder 
And now, as the first woman to occupy the chair, I'm honored to open this lecture this afternoon. Thank you. So the title of this lecture, Leading in Times of Radical Change, Innovation to Lead for a New Future, captures our current reality and envisions new possibilities. So radical comes from Latin and has significance in talking about leadership during crisis. So according to Merriam-Webster, the meaning of radical for many centuries was related to its origins, radicalis. I don't speak Latin well, so it, it has a meaning of root. Later, radical was used more figuratively to mean fundamental and examples like radical reform refer to changing the very root of a system. Now, radical is associated with extreme change and deviation from the norm. It is an appropriate word for this lecture as we look at leadership through the lens of changing the very root of the systems we lead with a vision for a new future. We seek to change cycles of systemic racism that marginalize students based on their color, orientation, socioeconomic circumstances, or beliefs, and deprives them of the experiences they need to thrive and excel. Our commitment is to a new future informed by the mistakes of the past and based on deep beliefs about what is possible for students, their schools, our districts, and our society. Leading in times of radical change is an invitation to lead for a new future. It takes courage to embrace change and confidence in one's ability to navigate forward. Some resist change because it means giving up what was comfortable. There is also the sense of loss that comes from change, right? However, if we're honest, we have to admit that there was a need to do things differently before this pandemic and radical change was made possible by its disruptions. Just consider the technological acceleration that has occurred. Our schools pivoted rapidly to protect students, feed them, and connect them to online learning. Granted, there were innumerable problems to be solved and risks to take, yet we moved forward. The impossible became our present day reality and paved the way for a new future. What would Dr. Malbo have said about crisis and radical change? So I'm going to quote from him his words. No social or educational revolution proceeds at an even pace or affects equally all segments of the society. So it is with the patterns of a social revolution on the established institutions. There is impact and resistance, resistance and impact, and ultimately there is change. Today you will hear from amazing leaders who are confronting the harsh truths of radical change with concrete strategies for the future. And we'll begin first with our dean, the dean from the, of the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, um, Dr. Pedro Nogueira, and we'll continue with perspectives from Dr. Dan Dominich, Executive Director of the National Superintendents Association, AASA. His national perspective will be followed by California superintendents who will add their unique experiences. Doctors Ben Drotti of the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, Paul Gothold of the San Diego County Office of Education, Dr. Ruth Perez, Deputy Superintendent of the Riverside County Office of Education. All of them will share their perspectives and practical advice. The panel will be facilitated by our Dean and Dr. Edgar Sasueta, the new Executive Director of AXA and also a Trojan. After the facilitated panel discussion, you will have the opportunity to engage with the speakers. So microphones are positioned in the aisles for easy access, so prepare yourself as you're listening to their remarks. Learning is most meaningful when it's interactive, and we invite you to make this inaugural lecture a deeply meaningful learning event. So please welcome to the podium, the Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, Pedro A. Noguera.
Good afternoon. And it's such a great pleasure to be with all of you and to, uh, to host this event <clears throat> to honor the legacy of Irving Melbo. Uh, <clears throat> when we had an opening, as you heard, Rudy Castrita, one of our distinguished faculty members, held this chair for several years and, and was stepping down uh, to retire, we opened it up to, to see who would apply within the school uh, for this new chair. And many of you know we have a number of distinguished faculty, many of whom have been superintendents themselves, and many of them applied. But Maria Ott was chosen, I think, because of who she is and what she represents. Those of you who know Maria know that she has been a leader on the front lines for many years. In fact, when Roy Romer, former governor of Colorado, came to Los Angeles to serve as superintendent, and quickly realized that the job of superintendent was harder than the job of governor, <laughs> he realized he needed some help. And the person he turned to immediately was Maria Ott, because he knew that she could provide the kind of steady leadership, the kind of no-nonsense vision, ability to get things done that he needed if he was going to move this system forward. So Maria, you embody and represent everything that I believe this chair and Irving Melbo believed in. And so we're so proud to have you as the new holder of the chair. So thank you. <clears throat> so I didn't have the pleasure of getting to uh, meet Irving Melbo or his wife, Virginia. Um, we are thankful to them for the legacy they've created. I had a chance to meet his granddaughter, uh, Laura, and thank you for joining us today. She is also an educator here in the LA area. Uh, <clears throat> what I do know about that legacy is it shows up today in the large number of leaders that are produced by the Rossier School of Education, many of whom are in the audience today. Raise your hand if you're a superintendent, currently a sitting superintendent. Okay. Take a look around the room. You know what I would say, the sign of a good leader is that when you leave, things don't fall apart. Right? So we're assuming things are not falling apart in your districts <laughs> while you're here. <laughs> we hope, we hope, right, Ben? Um, but but we, we take great pride in the fact that over 80 of the current <clears throat> superintendents of California are alumni. That's the Melbo legacy. It was a commitment to professional service, to leadership, and the preparation of leaders, which, as you know, is a huge task. Uh, my colleague, Jerry Murphy, at, um, who was the dean at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, often said, preparing an educational leader is like preparing someone to be a sea captain. Right? You can't prepare to be a sea captain in a classroom. <laughs> you can only do it at sea. And I think similarly, for ed these educational leaders, many of them are learning on the job. They are on the front lines handling very complex, difficult issues, particularly in the last two years because of the pandemic, where they had become public health experts and figure out what was the way to open schools safely during pandemic. They had to figure out how do I address the mental health needs of not only my students, but many of my staff, now we're grappling with learning loss because many kids were, have fallen far behind and so we're trying to figure out how do we accelerate learning now? And, and many of our districts have, have lost children uh, because families have moved on and moved out of this area. So the challenges they face are difficult, they're complex. Um, at Rossia, we are proud of the fact that as a school and a faculty, we are with those leaders in learning about these issues so that we can continue to be a resource. So Maria represents that, but many of our faculty are doing that work. Um, I always say that the way we learn about leadership is by learning from our leaders and then figuring out how to be the resource that they need to do the work they do. So I want to uh, thank uh, the Melbos for that legacy. Uh, Virginia Melbo herself was a school principal, so she herself was a, was a leader. Um, and Irving Melbo, as you've heard today, uh, was a visionary leader who understood that a professional school of education can't just do research. It also has to be deeply engaged in the field in supporting practitioners. And I think that legacy 
very much lives on today at Rossier. <clears throat> Let me now say something about our guest speaker, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for over 20 years now. <laughs> I first met Dan Dominich when he was still the superintendent of schools in Fairfax County, Virginia. And uh, we were in a program for principal, uh, superintendents rather at, at Harvard. And uh, <clears throat> we quickly realized that we had a cohort of superintendents we wanted to work with and support that uh, we were losing them. They were not surviving. We thought we were investing time into training and next thing you know, they were gone often not by their own choice, because the job of serving as a district leader is very precarious. And lots of good people end up being driven out of those jobs because of politics or because of other issues that come up that, which make the job undoable. Dan is a survivor. He's so much a survivor that not only has he led in some of the most complex places like Roosevelt, New York, right? a district that's probably been under state control longer than any district I know of uh, in the country, but he's also led the largest district in the state of Virginia. And now he, and for the last, I will say, several years, he's been the president of the American Association of School Administrators. So he works with leaders all across the country. And that association, together with USC, has launched, and Howard University, has launched an urban cohort of, to train and support leaders um, in the field. And we're very proud of that, that, that work with you. So Dan, I want to say it's such an honor to have you come to USC. Uh, you have shown us through your work, through your commitment at ASA, that it is possible to make a difference when you come with vision and integrity. And I've seen you um, in several settings where you've stood up to people who weren't happy with what you had to say, <laughs> but you said it anyway. And I think that says a lot about your backbone, your character, your integrity, and why you have survived as long as you have in this field. So Dan, thank you for joining us today. And please come on up and share some remarks with us. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro, for that. Uh, and, and it is, it's almost 25 years that we've been uh, working on this together. Um, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I had not been at USC ever before, even though I've, I've been in LA. As a matter of fact, side story, uh, before I became the superintendent in Fairfax County, I was a finalist for the superintendent here in LA. And uh, it, it, it didn't quite work out, and so uh, I wound up going to Fairfax instead. But this was back in like 1998, 99. And, and it was shortly after that that Roy Romer came on board. And I remember Roy calling me frequently to find out and, and telling me. And one day he admitted, he says, Dan, this is the toughest job I've ever had, I mean, being a superintendent. And I'm, I was glad, you know, a governor here, a governor. And, and, and he had a reputation because as governor uh, in Colorado, he had done really some great things in education. So it was great that he was here. But the first thing I did this morning when I got up, because I usually, I used to be a runner, but I had to have both hips replaced because I was a runner. I wore them out. <laughs> so this morning I took a nice long walk around the campus. What a beautiful, beautiful campus. And I, I noticed that there were a lot of students that were here already. And uh, I went over by the statue of the Trojan and I was taking a picture of the Trojan and one of the students came back and he says, let me take it, you should be in it. I said, wow, how nice, you know, and I stood up and I got a picture and I posted it on Facebook already and I'm getting all kinds of feedback. There I am with the Trojan, the USC, man. <laughs> what a place. So it's really an honor to be here with you today and to uh, share with you, um, you know, the, from my perspective, and uh, it's been, I am retiring, by the way, this coming February. Uh, this will be my last hurrah. I will have been uh, the executive director at ASA for 15 years by the time I leave, which is a long time, a long time. But it's been great because it's uh, given me a view of the superintendency at a level that very few people have, at the national level. And by the way, the same differences that we see in, in our population, political, cultural, and otherwise, exist in the superintendency. And one of the interesting things I see that I find when we have superintendents that come up on our board 
is to find out that those differences are there. Not everybody and not every superintendent is for gun control. Not every superintendent is against corporal punishment. Not every superintendent is into equity. And that's an understanding that we need to have as a national association in order to prevail. Because we have to talk to both sides and we have to come together. And that's the beauty of it, the ability to come together and say what are the things that we believe in, all of us, regardless of whatever cultural and political differences that we might have. But it's not easy. And this past year, as you can imagine, I have never seen the number of superintendents retire, quit, or get fired as I have seen this past year. In states like Alaska, for example, the turnover was almost 50%. Maryland, 45%. It's, it's really different, and it's going to have a major impact. And why did these things happen? Well, you remember that it's not it amazing when the pandemic first started, educators were heroes, right? The teachers were heroes, the health workers were heroes, the first responders were heroes. And as soon as the situation developed, where some kids were in person and other kids were not, we began to see the differences. Parents, working parents, didn't care. They wanted the kid in school, regardless. And then when schools open up, parents said, well, I'm not sending my child to a school that I don't think is safe, so don't make me send my child to school. So those parents. And then we went to the wearing of masks. If you wore masks, you were a hero. But for the parents that didn't want their kids wearing masks, forget it. In Oregon, the state of Oregon this year, six superintendents were fired, even though the governor of Oregon, through executive order, had required that all children wore masks in school. And six superintendents who carried out the order of the governor were fired by their boards because they didn't want the kids in their community to wear masks. And then we went into the vaccine issue, right? Who's going to get vaccinated? Who's not going to get vaccinated? Parents didn't want their kids vaccinated. Right? And few districts have required vaccination up until this point, but the whole issue of even making vaccines available became controversial. And then, as, as if these things hadn't been enough, we got into the cultural wars, the critical race theory, which to this day, I challenge you to find a single person that can tell you what the hell critical race theory is. <laughs> Nobody knows, but it's been used very effectively by boards of education, people that run now, and by the way, the board has become the battleground for politics, the school board. I was a superintendent for 27 years. I would have to pay people to come to a board meeting. It's the most boring thing in the world. It's where the board really handles the business of running a, a school district. Not anymore. Now the board of education is seen as the first step towards moving up politically. So we have around the country board races that are financed, not even within the community, but outside the community, for people to come in, take over the board, and start banning books, and start requiring in-person instruction regardless, and not wearing masks regardless. And you can't talk, well, you know, perfect example is Florida. You can't talk about racism. You can't talk about sexual orientation. All of those things are taboo. So as a result of that, a lot of our superintendents have said, I can't take this anymore. The biggest factor though, was you know, as a superintendent, all of us, and I was a superintendent for 27 years, all of us are used to being under fire. We're used to being threatened. We're used to all of these things that happen. What we are not used to is having our children and our spouses threatened to the point that you have to have police protection in your home. And that's a point that very few superintendents can put up with and say, you know, I can take it, but I'm not going to endanger my child or my spouse because somebody's going to, in Alabama, a superintendent's house was burned to the ground, burned to the ground. It's amazing. And during this past year, I lost count of the number of superintendents that I had to counsel and put in counseling because they were actually thinking of committing suicide. That's how serious this whole issue has been. 
So when we see the outflow of superintendents, it's not surprising. But then the same thing is true of principals. And the same thing is true of teachers. And that's one of the, probably the biggest issues that you're all facing right now as you begin the school year, that you don't have enough staff. Because teachers have also been abused. And teachers don't get paid what superintendents get paid. So teachers say, hey, I can make more in the private sector right now. Because the private sector has all these openings and they can't fire people. And here I am, a college graduate. I'm articulate. I'm intelligent. They're going to offer me more money, more pay. And I don't have to put up with all of this nonsense. So we are facing a serious shortage of our teachers in our classrooms. And it's not going to be resolved anytime soon. Because as you probably know, in terms of your own school of education, the pipeline is drying up. All of the schools of education that I talk to, their enrollments are down. When you see the NEA and the AFT do their surveys, their teachers, the teachers say that they're counseling their children to never become a teacher. 54% of teachers have counseled their children not to go into education. And over 50% have indicated that they intend to leave the profession within the next couple of years. So it's a major problem. Yes, the pandemic was a factor, but the cultural wars have become as major and probably even a more serious factor than the pandemic itself. And that's what we're going to have to deal with in education. I don't know if you saw the, uh, well, the PDK report, uh, survey that is done is about to come out. But I will tell you in advance, if you probably don't already know, that still, still to this day, the majority of parents love their public schools. They love the school that their child attends. And they love the teachers that teach their children. But when you ask them how they feel about their district as a whole, it drops from a majority to the 40s. And when you ask about education as a whole in the nation, it's down into the 30s. Bottom line is that to know your school is to love your school. If you have a child in school, those parents are going to love their school. They're going to want to support their schools. So as we think about, and there is, by the way, in the Washington, D.C. area, a group called the Learning First Alliance which is made up of 14 of the national organizations, the teachers, the school boards. We're all the principals. We're all part of that group. And we're in the process of trying to put together a single message that we are going to want to send out to all of our members in order, in essence, to cover the entire education workforce by all of these organizations. And the message is going to focus on that fact, that our parents are our biggest supporters. And that's where we have to go. We're not going to win the war outside of that. We're not going to win the war with taxpayers that don't have children in school anymore, or individuals that are buying all of this propaganda that they are being fed about what happens and doesn't happen in schools. I was recently uh, asked to speak at the uh, Educator Writers Association. They had their annual conference in uh, Orlando, Florida. As a matter of fact, your current superintendent uh, was there, uh, my good friend Alberto Carvalho. Uh, so we were uh, on a panel together. But one of the uh, sessions that I was in, I was asked to, uh, the question by the writers was, what is keeping educators up at night? And the point was that, in essence, it was the learning back gap. And I said to them, knowing that I'm in front of all of these writers, and they're all there to write a story, right? That's what, I, that's what education writers are about. I said, I'm going to give you a headline right now. Get your pencils ready to write. It says, the learning gap is not what's keeping educators up at night. What's keeping educators up at night is, are they going to be shot? Are their children going to be shot? Is a bullet going to kill them or the children that they're with? Is there security in my school? Because we know now that it doesn't matter where you are. It can happen anywhere. And we don't know. That's what's keeping educators up at night. The staff shortage is keeping educators up at night. 
All of these things are keeping educators up. It's not the learning gap because kids continue to learn. It's not like they stopped learning just because they weren't going to school. The kids are learning. And as a matter of fact, as I talk to many of our superintendents around the country, not surprising, if you live in a wealthy suburban community, those kids are almost up to par already. You're gonna see that when the NAEP results come out pretty soon, that the learning gap isn't as bad depending on where you are though. If you live in an impoverished community, if you live in an urban area where there's already an achievement gap, you're gonna see that the achievement gap has gotten even worse. So the problem has not been the pandemic. We had that even before the pandemic. We've been chasing that achievement gap for years. The pandemic has just made it wider. But we know what we need to do to correct it. And those are the kinds of things that I wanna share with you today in terms of as we look forward, what can we do to address the problems that we're, uh, we've been facing? And you know, I, I think of uh, Winston Churchill when he said, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? And then necessity is the mother of invention. The reality is that the pandemic has opened the door for opportunities for us to do things that we have wanted to do, because by the way, I don't think there's a single thing I'm gonna talk about here that we don't know about. There isn't a single thing here that as superintendents we have not attempted to do in our communities. But the problem is that education is such a traditional organization, it's so conservative, that bringing about any kind of change is almost impossible and very hard to do. But there are some low-hanging fruit that I think have been brought about because of the pandemic. Think about what happened to the school calendar during these past three years. What school calendar? You went to school when you could and you didn't when you couldn't, okay? So the school calendar all of a sudden was broken. Yet most of our school systems are working on the same school calendar 10 months that begin either at the beginning of August or September throughout the year, 10 months, and then two months off for vacation for the summer. Well, the reality is that every teacher knows, and I was a teacher, probably all of us here were teachers, we know what happens in September when those kids come back. We spent practically the first couple of weeks, if not the whole month, just trying to get them back to where they were before they left. So we've already been dealing with learning loss forever, but we've never done anything to correct it. There are districts now that are seriously considered going to year-round year schooling. And year-round schooling is not difficult, by the way. I did it when I was superintendent in Fairfax in 24 of my schools, we went to year-round schooling. And it worked fine because we did like 10 months 10 weeks at a time with a couple of weeks off. So we basically had four semesters here in the course of the year, but year round. And it was great, the teachers loved it because they could go to uh, on vacation, go skiing at a time of the year when people weren't off like they usually would be when schools are out. The parents loved it because they could take their kids to Disney World in downtime and have a great time. The problem was though, that because I was doing it, by the way, I had about 200 schools in Fairfax. So, you know, 22, 24 was a drop in the bucket. The problem was that parents would say to me, well, Dan, Dr. Dominich, he says, you know, I have one kid that's on the year round, and then my other kids are on the regular program, and you know, it, it's too dysfunctional. We can't get together on this kind of thing. So, as often is the case, when I left Fairfax, so did year-round schools. <laughs> it, it, it disappeared, it's no longer there. But that's a concept that we have to consider. There is no need for us. Here we are in 2022, there is no need for us to continue this process of having school for 10 months and then two months off over the summer. And what happened during the last couple of summers? Well, we've seen that many of you, what you did in order to accelerate learning is that now you opened up summer school for all kids, not just the high school kids that have failed the course. So a lot of school districts had school available for from kindergarten through grade 12. The problem is it's not required. So in most cases, districts didn't have more than maybe 20% of their kids attending. And the teachers were burnt out. So in a lot of cases, 
they didn't have enough teachers. Districts didn't have enough teachers to run the kind of summer program that they would have wanted to. But that's an option, and that's a low-hanging fruit that we could think of year-round schooling. The other one is virtual learning. There is no doubt that virtual learning was a disaster at the beginning of the pandemic. Why? Because who was ready for it? Well, interestingly enough, the wealthy suburban districts were ready for it because their kids all had a laptop already, their teachers had already been trained, they were already offering online courses. So for, the, for them, this was an easy transition. But we know that during the pandemic, over 14 million students did not have a laptop, did not get virtual learning because they either didn't have the laptop or their homes didn't have access, internet access. And where do those 14 million students live? Here again, mostly your urban, underfunded Title I school districts around the country. So that is a problem. But today, a lot has happened. School districts have gotten into the virtual learning. The platforms are better. The delivery is better. It's available. There are districts now that no longer allow for inclement weather days. The snow day may be a thing of the past. If it's an inclement weather day, Virtual learning at home, we're not gonna miss education. And if we're really interested in accelerating the learning and giving the kids an opportunity, then the time to do it is after school, during vacations, weekends. That's the time when students can, on their own, access programs that will allow them to catch up. We know that 10%, at least, of our students have opted not to go back to school in person. And who are those 10%? The kids that are self-starters. The kids that want to make progress at their own rate. They don't want to be held back by the rest of the class. They love virtual learning. I, I have a uh, grandson like that in high school. The kid's a genius, but he doesn't want to go in, be in school. Because he says, hey, Grandpa, you know, I, I want to be able to move, and I'm moving on ahead, and I'm taking all of these courses, et cetera. You know, I'm ready to go to college already. I don't want to be held back. So here is the situation. It's not for every child, but it is an excellent opportunity to help children catch up, to help children accelerate, to break away from everybody at the same time. And by the way, that leads us to this whole notion of personalized learning. When I started when I left the classroom in the mid-70s. Actually, yeah, it was 1977. I got a job in uh, what's known in uh, Long Island as the BOCES, the Board of Cooperative Educational uh, Services, which is an education service agency in, in all other states. And my job was to uh, scour the world for innovative programs in education. And one of the places that I found was in, uh, in Ohio, Kettering, Ohio, the Kettering Foundation in Ohio, a program called Individually Guided Education. And this was a program that attempted to personalize learning by creating teams of teachers, not one teacher working with one classroom and a group of kids, but a team of four teachers working with 100 uh, students and organizing the day in, in, in periods where there would be a lecture given by one of the teachers to maybe 50 of the students. The other teacher would be working one-on-one, -on -one, and the other two would be working with smaller groups. It was a great concept, a great idea. But what happened when you try to implement it? Well, those of us that have tried to get teachers to work as a team with others, as opposed to just closing the door and saying, this is my classroom, these are my kids, and I'm gonna do whatever the hell I wanna do, it's a tough issue, it's a tough problem, and it has to be overcome. But we have today the opportunity to personalize learning like we've never had. Why? Again, because of the technology. Because the technology allows the teachers to be able to work with children and allow some of those children that are very capable to learn on their own, to accelerate at their own pace as opposed to being held back. Likewise, the kids that need more instruction have that same opportunity. So the concept becomes not one of the entire class moving at the same time to achieve at the same level, but allowing children to learn at their own pace. Nothing new. This is something that I believe every one of us here, we've known about this, we have wanted to do this. This might be the opportunity to move in that direction. 
where we personalize learning. Another factor that was part of the pandemic uh, is the Carnegie unit. You know how many states still have requirements that you can't get a high school credit unless you spend so many times in your seat in your class? Well, what happened to that this past year? I'm th we've got a lot of school districts out there where kids got credit for courses where they weren't sitting in their seat in their school in person. They were doing it virtually. So that's another thing here. We're, we're, in spite of the fact that we have this technology and the ability for kids to learn anywhere at any place in time, we're still requiring kids to be in person, in their seats, in order to get credit. And by the way, has nothing to do with whether they've achieved. I mean, how many times have we seen students in our schools who could have taken the test at the end of the first semester and pass it, yet they were forced to stay in that class for, the, for that entire year because they had to do that. So that's the Carnegie unit is another concept that we ought to be able to uh, get rid of. One of the things that I've also tried to champion over the years, and it's been tough, is our grade level structure. Remember Horace Mann? Horace Mann went to, Ven uh, to uh, Vienna, and he was exposed to kindergarten through a, a structure by age for organizing kids in a classroom. And he brought that back at that time, I think he was the chair of the Massachusetts Board of Education. And he brought that concept back to America when we were still in terms of the one room schoolhouse. Well, that was back in the, what, 19th century? Here we are, 2022, and how do we organize our, our schools? By grade level. If you're five years old, you're pre-K, six year in kindergarten, or, and, and then up the line. That is no longer, instead of organizing our children in terms of their ability to learn, we don't. And again, that's something that I tried. I tried, in, again, in, in my districts, I did in, in terms of kindergarten to three, uh, non-graded. And you know what was my biggest problem? Whenever we had the parents that would come to the school and I would go to the school, the parents would come up to me and says, Dr. Dominic, says, you have my kindergarten child in the same class as first and second graders. That's not right. Or I would have a parent that would come, Dr. Dominic, my third grader is in the same class as, as, as second, first, and, and, and kindergarten kids. That's an insult. And I would say, do you have other children at home? They say, yeah, we have three, four kids. He says, so do you separate them by age? <laughs> and of course the answer was, was no. But this is still something that's ingrained in what we do, and it's something that needs to change. And this is an opportunity to, to change that. The other thing uh, that's very much a, a part of it, and it's very difficult to get rid of it, is our testing culture. You know, the fact that everything is about the tests. Everything is about the tests. And you know, everybody is anxiously waiting the results of the tests to see how much learning you know, ha has been lost. The very kids that are at the bottom of our achievement gap are the kids that need attention in terms of their social and emotional needs, in terms of their health. And we know there's been a lot of research that has been done in this area that children that are at homes where they're not being fed, where they're being abused, where there are no parents, where they even be maybe homeless. Those children coming into our school, into our classes, the last thing they want is to be taught a lesson. They're hungry. They have issues, emotional issues that have to be dealt with. And we know that social emotional learning is a major factor. And I'm so happy to see that so many of you in your school districts have recognized that. I have a great video of a superintendent in North Carolina, his addressing his faculty on the opening of school, this was last September, saying, when you as a teacher go into your class this year, I don't want the first word out of your mouth if you're in a math class to say, all right, everybody sit down and open your math book to page 24. The first thing I want you to do is to say, how was your summer? How are you doing? How is your family? Let's talk about how you spent your time. Let's deal with the issues that you've been experiencing. This past year, behavior was record numbers. Behavioral issues in our schools were unbelievable. And that's not gonna stop. 
That's going to continue because these youngsters have been experiencing the same issues that their parents have and perhaps even worse than their parents. And so they're coming to school and they want somebody to engage them. They want somebody to care for them. They don't want somebody that's gonna make them sit down, open the book and start learning because they're not ready for that. So the fact that so many of us are focusing on the social emotional needs suggests that we understand that before we look at those tests, those standardized tests that are gonna be used to judge the performance of the districts, the teachers, the kids, that we focus first on the needs of the kids. Because if we do that, achievement will grow. And, and there's plenty of evidence that that is indeed the case. But that's a huge cultural shift. Another huge cultural shift, and that affects you in higher education, is the fact that we know that 60% of our students do not wind up with a four-year college degree. They do not. 60% do not. What are we doing for those kids? Just about every school that I know of, the mission of that school is to get all of their students to graduate high school and go on to college and get a degree. Well, if that's our mission, there are very few school systems around the country that have met it, because that's not the reality. And we see that happening today. We see that in terms of our workforce. We see that in terms of, of, of kids that don't necessarily want to go to four. And by the way, those same 40% are going to be there all the time. Those kids do want to go to college. They want to be professionals. They want to be engineers, doctors, teachers, whatever. They want to be there. They're not going to go away. But the ones that don't have that drive, we're not doing anything to prepare them. So providing pathways for kids beginning probably towards the end of middle school, not even the beginning of high school, to expose them to opportunities that are there, okay? In terms of career, in terms of skills, and to say it's okay, because that's the problem with the culture here. We look down on anybody that doesn't have a college degree. We do, we look down on them. We need to begin to honor the plumber as we do the PhD. It's okay for you to be a good mechanic. It's okay for you to be a good painter. It's okay for you to do whatever your passion is to do and to develop the skills to do it. That's gonna help you to lead the kind of life, enriching life that you want. And it's gonna help our environment and, and our businesses. Our businesses keep talking about the thousands of skilled labor jobs that they need and they don't have because we're not doing that. But we're seeing around the country the growth of apprenticeship programs. We're seeing the growth of pathways, all of these other things. There are many more things that we could talk about. But I just wanted to hit on a, on a couple of doable things. At ASA, we have established a Learning 2025 initiative that we have over 120 school districts involved. And these districts are all about moving in the direction of making these radical changes. There are, as a matter of fact, four districts here in California, Cajon Valley, Pleasant View, San Ramon, and Valverde. And Valverde has been de declared one of 12 lighthouse districts around the country. And these are all districts that are pursuing, with our support and our help, to make these changes, to create an educational system that provides equity, and by the way, underlying all of this is the equity issue. And let's face it, there's a huge pushback, a huge pushback on equity. I mean, social emotional learning is a dirty word. Equity is a dirty word, depending on the district that you're in. You can't even talk about these things in some of these communities. We can't allow that to happen. We, and reference was made uh, earlier to this, we have to have the courage as system leaders to do what is right for our kids. And that is first and foremost. We need to continue to be the champions for the children that don't have other champions. And that's where equity comes in. So ASA is working uh, with uh, 120 some districts to try to help them achieve this. We expect that by the end of this year, we'll be well over 200. We've partnered with, um, if you know Ray McNulty and Bill Daggett, they're working with us, as is Karen Garza and Patel. They're working with us to help us achieve this. I'm very grateful to our friends here at USC who together 
Uh, we developed an urban program for aspiring educators that just started in eighth year, eighth year. And we have placed superintendents around the country, successful superintendents around the country in urban areas where they're needed the most. So thank you so much for working with us to allow this to happen. So that's just a taste. Uh, nothing new here, nothing that you haven't heard before, nothing radical. These are all things that we're not doing and we've known about for years. And we, this is the opportunity to begin to do these things. So thank you so much for allowing me to join you this afternoon. No, you're not going very far. Um, I have the pleasure now of bringing up the panel and our uh, facilitators. And Dan, we'd like you to stay up on the stage so that uh, you can join the panel. So if you would take the second seat, I'm going to introduce our panel as they come up. Um, our two facilitators on either end. So we have three amazing leaders who are going to share their experiences following what you've heard from uh, Dr. Dominich, and they're going to get some tough questions from the facilitators. Um, so let me introduce them first. We have Dr. Ben Drotti, superintendent of Santa Monica Malibu Unified. He's been there since 2017, where he continues to skillfully navigate complex political issues, right, Ben, in a very diverse community. Um, he started his career as a chemistry teacher and a football coach. And the one thing I've, I've loved about you, you never lost that commitment to excellence in the classroom. So welcome. Dr. Paul Gothold, our San Diego County Superintendent of Schools also. Also since 2017, and he has focused on an equity agenda that's helping his 42 districts, 160 charter schools, and five community college districts uh, improve outcomes for students. I, I encourage you to look at data from San Diego County. Uh, there's really amazing trends, especially for women. And thank you for the work you're doing to support the advancement of women in your county. We also have um, Dr. Ruth Bettis, Deputy Superintendent of the Riverside County Office of Education. <laughs> Dr. Bettis has extensive leadership experiences as superintendent. She served as uh, superintendent of Paramount Unified, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Instruction for LA Unified, Superintendent of the Norwalk La Mirada Unified School District. Um, She's another, all three of these, I want to tell you, are equity warriors. They're courageous, brave, and unafraid to do what they need to do as leaders. Our facilitators, um, let me introduce again our Amory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, Dr. Pedro Noguera, and I'll have you sit here on the right side. And then our other facilitator, um, and I'm so, so pleased to introduce him, Dr. Edgar Sasueta, who um, is the executive director of our state association, AXA. And prior to, <laughs> prior to being selected as executive director, Dr. Sasueta served six years as the senior director of policy and government relations for AXA. He's also a proud Trojan, and I was honored to serve on his dissertation committee. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our two facilitators and let you begin to put some tough questions out there. And Dan, thank you for joining and being part of the panel. Dr. Aunt Maria, thank you. Thank you for those introductions, and thank you for everybody. Uh, and, uh, it was said earlier uh, in, in the program, getting anywhere in Los Angeles at 4 o'clock is, is, uh, is a struggle, so the fact that you guys not, not to mention leaving your districts and whatnot, but actually getting here. Uh, thank you. What, what a great program and what, what great remarks uh, from Dan. And we'll, we'll reflect on that a little bit. Uh, as, as Maria pointed out, as Dr. Ott pointed out, since, and since I have the mic, I'm going to use it for, for a second just to, 
to call out a couple of my own personal VIPs because I am a proud product of, of the Rossier School. Uh, Dr. Pike is, uh, Dr. Ah, uh, Dr. Cash, who I saw earlier. Uh, you know, I kind of stacked my, my my dissertation committee there, as you could see, but I, they <laughs> they were great and uh, happy me helping me get through that process and learn so much through that experience. And as as Maria pointed out, I'm I'm proud to have uh, the privilege. Uh, to represent the Association of California School Administrators. Uh, and we have a VIP of our own, our, our president, Dr. Aaron Simon. Apparently, we let Bruins in the, in the house, too. So. <laughs> a couple of them, a couple of them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to kick it off. And I think Dr. Nagara and I are going to uh, trade off here. But I'll, I'll pose a, a first question to, to the panel. And I know in. This has been stated a number of times, but it, it could be argued. I mean, the role of not just a superintendent, but you talk about our site administrators anywhere in, in district leadership, educators as a whole, it could be argued. There was few jobs that were tougher, right? Like there was a lot going on, uh, and, but just for all the reasons stated. And I think as we're talking about radical leadership, as we're talking about the perspectives, just kind of to open it up, and maybe you could also use the opportunity to set the landscape of what the last few years have looked like for you folks, is what, what have you learned about leadership during the pandemic? You know, everybody had their perspectives, and we'll get into some other uh, topics as we go through the conversation. But just this whole notion of leadership, how did that evolve for you over the last number of years? Uh, we'll start with Paul. Thank you, Edgar. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I forget, congratulations, Dr. Ott. Much love and appreciation for everything you do. I mean, so well deserved, and um, I, I know I'm going to forget to say it, so I'm saying it now. I um, <clears throat> I think you know there's so many lessons learned. I don't know where to pin it down. I I would say that we we had a better idea of the evolving definition of leadership and those traits through the pandemic. Um, because those who were able to thrive in this setting um, could not sit back on those old definitions of command and control and, and ask for authorization. And those districts and organizations that were, were truly doing the work in support of kids were grounded in a, in a moral imperative, were, were leading with, with empathy and compassion, um, co-constructing with our, our communities and, and those superintendents um, I guess for us, you know, building a coalition that's all in support of our schools, when those challenges hit, we just activated those, those existing relationships in a different way. Um, and so some of the greatest ideas have come out of this time, um, during a time of tragedy. Um, and, and I would still say all the remarkable work around connecting 77,000 kids to the internet in short order getting you know, so many resources and support, um, we're still layering superficial solutions on deep-rooted problems. Those conditions have been around for centuries. They've just taken on a different form. And so bring, shining a light on that and bringing attention to what we do have to do from a policy perspective because all of those things are to be celebrated. Kids having access, kids having internet, that's a basic right. How do we get here in the first place? And, and I think just that instead of the through line, but horizontal, vertically, where you're building teams and really empowering people to do the work that's necessary in support of our, I'll just pick on Jeanette because she's our deputy superintendent and she's sitting here. But one of the committees we set up was an immigration task force. So during the time of the pandemic, I don't know if how, how uh, public or, or knowledgeable people are with this, but 80,000 you know, American-born kids were displaced, either through uh, policy or uh, economic insecurity and things that happened during the, during the shutdown. Um, and this is just Baja, California. We're not talking about the rest of the country. And the vast majority of those kids from California, and the vast majority of those kids from California, from San Diego. So we set up an immigration task force. How are we going to help our children? How are we going to help our children? Because based on historical data from 2008, 
when the last run of, of migration because of economic insecurity and recession, when the kids didn't come back, or they did come back and had holes in their educational program, how are we going to prevent, how are we going to stop this? What are we going to do better this time? And the best ideas that were born out of it was starting a, a global academy where a kid could take our classes, continue their education online, in person, just across the border. Better yet, we're in conversation with the Department of Mexico and, and working on uh, articulation agreements to build a binational diploma. So instead of accepting defeat and, and the tragedy that exists and, and, the, and the, the horrible things our kids and families experienced, turn it into something really unique and positive, something that doesn't exist. And, and really, that's what we're talking about is new opportunity. Where are those new opportunities for our children who have been harmed? And, and you know, for, for, our, for our office, our priority is putting, putting our resources and support to those communities who experience the most harm. And so this school is an example of something that you can take a, a horrific situation and turn it into something very special. So I'll, I'll stop on that. Ruth, you have an interesting background in terms of you've, have, you've held numerous leadership positions, not just here in California, uh, but around the country. Kind of in that same vein, what, I mean, what, what, what did you learn over the last number of years in the different capacities that, that you've held? Thanks, Ed, uh, Edgar. I, uh, and I, I have to always recognize Maria and Darlene uh, Robles because these two precious women have, were my, have been my mentors for the last 14, 15 years since I moved to California from the East Coast. And, uh, and they are such an inspiration to me, and I just have to lift them up wherever I am. Um, you know, the last few years has really, <laughs> have really been uh, quite the, uh, I, I have 20 years in the superintendency, and yet the last, the last uh, four years, I would say, before going to the county office, um, of Riverside, I have to say, of course, have been my, my hardest years because uh, even before COVID, I dealt with a chromium-6 uh, issue that took it in the city of Paramount that absorbed my time um, away from the classroom, unfortunately, dealing with uh, the community and something that uh, people jumped on and created an entire board turnover in the city uh, of Paramount. And then COVID hit and I ran my district from my dining room for a year uh, before, um, before going to the county office of ed. Uh, but I, I will say that my greatest concern, and it's, it's part of my role that now I value greatly, is supporting our leaders and the bench uh, that is there right now. Because as you heard Dan say, so many have said, I've had enough, I'm going away. Uh, but as I share, it's also a time of opportunity, especially for women in leadership, because that 45% of superintendents that have, you know, thrown in the towel, God bless them, uh, and others who say, I'm going to retire in two or three years now, ha those positions have to be filled. So for a lot of women, especially, and, uh, and men that have aspired to be the top leaders in school districts and make a difference, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, an opportunity to move up and become leaders. At the same time, uh, as we look at the principalship and we look at district level positions and we look at the superintendency especially, it is a time to uh, have tremendous support for these leaders. Thank you, Paul. This is a time to have, to build that bench in a very unique and strategic ways. And one of the things that we've been looking at in Riverside County is what, ha what can we learn from outside organizations about what they learned about dealing and working through crisis. Uh, there are a lot of very stressful positions out there uh, from, you know, um, in hospitals, doctors and nurses, air traffic controllers, all those people that deal with stressful jobs 
how do they deal with crisis? And one of the things that we're learning through research is that they have dealt with crisis in very strategic and unique ways. And there's a lot there that we can learn, that we can adapt to the educational leadership setting to help us lead differently, to help us uh, lead in, in very strategic ways that can help us sustain our current leaders and our future leaders um, in the superintendency, in the principalship, in positions at central office where they are greatly needed. That is a focus that we have right now because of the tremendous need that's there, because of the heart that we have for our superintendents and everything that has been described that, as Dan said, is nothing new, but there are unique challenges that they have to deal with. How can we build strategically um, our superintendents, our people, so that they can thrive, that they can exist in this incredible setting uh, that they are in right now. Ben, as uh, uh, working for AXA, I get to work with a lot of interesting districts, a lot of interesting places. Uh, as Dan talks about the diversity of our country, goes without saying there's a lot of different types of districts in our state. right? And I have to say, Santa Monica, Malibu, probably one of those unique communities for those yeah. th that don't know about the dynamics there. So I'm yeah. sure yeah. you know, have some takeaways in terms of leadership of what, you, what you've dealt with over the last couple of years over your, your tenure there. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for, uh, thank you for the invite here. First, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, USC for the great work that, you're doing, that you do. Uh, I'm not a graduate of here. I'm from Fresno State. And I think we're about to kick you guys' butt in two weeks here. But... <laughs> <laughs> we but, told him he wasn't allowed to say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> did but, the point, yeah, but, but the point is, <laughs> a, a lot of my staff, administrators, come to uh, the, uh, the USC uh, for their education, and you guys do a wonderful job. So. So uh, thank you for that. So uh, you're right, Santa Monica Malibu is unique. Uh, some people coin us as the re Republic of Santa Monica. <laughs> Others call us Berkeley South. <laughs> you know, you're talking about very active community, uh, very engaged community, and, very, and community that is very supportive of, of the school district. But they all have opinions, and, and they have a lot of resources. So I guess I'll talk about my experience in, in dealing with Santa Monica Malibu because every district was, was unique. And I, and I had the pleasure of talking to a lot of other superintendents for our own mental health, just to see where they are and just to kind of see what they're doing. But every district was unique and how you lead, what skills you have to incorporate in each of the areas have to do with your, your local community. In Santa Monica Malibu, knowing that uh, they, 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 they love the district, they love the staff. The way it goes is teach, parents love teachers more than anybody else. They love their principal second, and, they, uh, and then they like the superintendent next, and then the board. Uh, that's, that's the order. I think that's probably consistent to, to everybody I'm, I else. I think I'm fourth on that. Oh, You're fourth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, we, when, when the pandemic hit us, uh, the, uh, obviously we were actually the first school district to shut down, because that's my, how my community is. You better shut down now, kind of a thing. And the board's contacting me. I was at a conference. I had to call everybody, cabinet, have an emergency meeting, and say, look, okay, we're shutting down, irrespective of what the county office have said. And you don't get me wrong, all these other superintendents got pretty pissed off at me you know, <laughs> <laughs> for doing that. But two days later, everybody else went on. So, so I was praised for that. But four weeks later, I, was, I became a villain all of a sudden. How dare they, it sucks, what are you doing? Well, I thought you guys wanted to shut down and it just, it didn't, it didn't make sense. That's when I realized, look, I can't do this by myself. Everybody's coming to me to problem solve and to be the answer for everything. I've got to invite the community to the mm -hmm. conversation. Okay, this is our school, it's not my school, it's not the board school, this is our school. And, and, and the good thing is I already had a structure in which we worked in teams. I have parent groups uh, often engaged with PTA my black parent or association that I have, that Latino parent association, DLAC, they were a part of our system already. And so I, ha I had that already, and then the principals were already organized into teams, PLCs, uh, and, and whatnot. So that question I asked, this is our school, what are we doing? What, what, uh, inviting everybody to the issue is really what, what ended up uh, in the saving us. And then so, and let, let me, let me, so let me fast forward. We did, we did the work. 
and after the city council, uh, city manager was fired because of the conflict that existed with, uh, with the pandemic and, and the racial issues that were occurring in the city. The police chief got fired. And then all of a sudden, I became the senior leader of the whole community that quickly. You know? So I'm like, God, everybody's looking to me now. <laughs> and uh, so, so but, but by me, but right now, I'm praised because of that work that we did together. So I guess the point I would say to you is, when you're in a football team or a choir or a band, when you're trying to get to a certain outcome and you're working together, relationships are built. Um, respect is built amongst the people who are in the, in the game. And at the end, if you're successful, what happens is you're closer than ever. Yeah. I think that's what happened to me and my staff and my community. And right now, I enjoy a situation in which when I go anywhere, like, thank you for doing what you did. We, we love you guys. And things are good in that sense. But I would say that all that happened to do because I invited everybody to a problem. Yeah. And, and so I, I would say in a complex situation like this, you can't be the only one that's going to be there. That's right. One to respond. You got to make sure you distribute and make sure others also speak. And, and you got to then be in a position where you, if you don't have an answer, don't have an answer. In fact, sometimes you got to be the last one to speak. You ask a question and you formulate an idea and then you speak after the fact. So um, anyway, that's, that's what I would say. Before we hand it to uh, Dr. Noguera, Noguera um, Dan, now that we let you hydrate, got you a little water here, um, any reflections just on, and obviously you talked a lot about leadership and what you've seen around the country, but just any perspective from <coughs> what you've heard? Well, I, I think we, we've, we've heard from the superintendents the, the kinds of things that I was talking about. Uh, your situation is a perfect example. By the way, the, the strategy there is that when you let people meet and you let them come up with what you see as the consensus, you come out with that consensus decision and you're a winner. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's the strategy there. Uh, but yes, uh, it, it is, uh, it's an issue uh, that becomes in a situation where you can get people to reach consensus in that way, that works. The problem that we've had with many of our superintendents is that they're in the communities where it, it's one way. And it's this way or no way. And that's where the superintendent really has to make a decision. Am I going to remain here to pursue my convictions and what I feel is the right thing to do? Uh, and what they're telling me to do is not what I believe in. So that's where we see a lot of superintendents parting, parting ways. But no question about it. The first step is to do exactly what you, you, you said, to come together and to try to uh, you know, build consensus and then follow that, that route. So that's a great, great point. So let me, let me follow up now with some of the uh, <clears throat> themes that have come up. Because most of what we've heard so far, starting with you, Dan, was how hard the job is, especially right now. My question is, what keeps you in the job? Why do you want this job in the first place? <laughs> if it's so difficult, <laughs> why would you want this job? And what's your advice to um, aspiring superintendents out there in the audience who are thinking, after listening, maybe this is not such a good job after all? So, um, so I don't know if anyone could start up. I'll, 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 yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Paul. You know, there is nothing, nothing more important than the well-being of our children and families, particularly those that have experienced the most harm. And what a, what a blessing to be in a position where you can get people together around a common purpose and thread to do something truly remarkable uh, in the interests of the human condition. We're talking about being in the business of people for people. When, when we had these weekly meetings with the superintendents during the pandemic, and, and, it, and a lot of times they just needed to vent, I don't know if I can continue to do this. We always went back to two things. And one is our kids deserve our best selves to represent them. And, and the second was, if not us, who? Honestly. The, the, the purpose around what we do is so much bigger than whether I have a bad day or a sleepless night or if what my wife would say, you know, how much longer do you want to be a, a human piñata? <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, people I, I look to hire, 
that I look to, to, to get in the trenches with are the people that are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure our kids get what they need and deserve. Mm. That's a calling. I, I become so disinterested in how much you know in an interview. In fact, we've stripped apart all of our job descriptions and interview questions because they're so technical, they're to so transactional. Mm -hmm. I, I need to know what's in your soul. I need to know what fuels your passion to do what we do. Um, it's not a job. It just isn't. And I, I have a unique perspective on this just because I started as a teacher for LA County Office of Education in 1992. Dr. Robles was my superintendent. <laughs> and uh, quite frankly, working in the adjudicated system for 10 years, you're looking at someone who's never expelled a kid in 30 years, even in the comprehensive district. I don't believe in it. I was always interested in the conditions that caused the infraction and to get deep into relationship with the, with the kid and the family. All to say, I've seen a lot of kids change their lives. Tons of them that are still in contact with me today. Hey, G, we did what you said. We got our degrees. We're doing this, 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 and this. So it, it was never easy to begin with. It wasn't supposed to be. But if I can't stand in the middle of it in times of crisis, even as bad as it, and by the way, Dan, I am a, I don't know if they're battle scars, but I've experienced what you described earlier with security detail outside the house, Kids can't open the door, the whole thing. And, and during that time, Homeland Security said, hey, you can shut the program down. This is too political. Fox has carried it all over the country. At that time, we were teaching the unaccompanied minors, 1,500 in the convention center. Stories got twisted, and we became public enemy number one. And I adamantly said, no, we're not going to stop. This is what we do. We provide love, care, and support for kids who need the most help. And if you've ever seen a kid get reunited with a parent after being separated for two years, I mean, my gosh. But I, I, I am OK continuing to do the right thing and stand up for the right thing, irregardless of what the conditions are. But I don't defend my right to be right and cause strain. Uh, one of the things we talk about is win the relationship, not the argument. Because if I can win the, win the relationship, I have a really good chance of persuasion, influence, and in bringing people along and getting them, everyone under the same tent for a common purpose. I don't know any Republican, independent, Democrat that sees a kid hurt and in need that's going to say, no, leave them there. Mm -hmm. So do it because it's the right thing to do. And I was thinking of retiring before the pandemic anyway. So just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look old enough to retire, Paul. So. <laughs> there are plenty of folks that are ready and willing to step up and do this. We have to do what my, my friend and colleague here said, is prepare them. We have a leadership pipeline through Rise San Diego to diversify <laughs> People of color and women in our workforce, we have a cohort of 50 teacher leaders. We're positioning for assistant principal principals with an a, a onboarding, coaching, superintendency. We'll do whatever it takes. But uh, our kids deserve the best, and we're going to give it to them. Go ahead, Ben. I want to I expand on uh, what Paul just got through talking about in terms of what we mean as, edu as an education institution to the world, and, um, and this is something I'm going to tell you that I've told my staff. But before that, let me back up, because this is something that I'm really, I've been reading about and really to fortify myself. There's a book called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss. I don't know if you get a chance to read it. It's pretty powerful. It talks about a rhythm, the, 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 the generational rhythm that we experience. 
and it's actually pretty predictive. So we're in 2022. Uh, every 80 to 100 years, there's a phenomena that occurs in the world or in the country that talks about there's a gridlock in which people are confused, they're frustrated, they are starting to not buy into a social contract of agreeing with each other because, because there's economic despair, there is uh, just issues throughout. Uh, uh, and so, so right now, the last time, about 80 years ago, the rhetoric that occurred 80 years ago is what we're hearing right now. That was in 1942. Remember that, 1942, World War II, and uh, the autocracies, scapegoating of things. This, the conversations, you know, you listen to Viktor Orban, it sounds almost similar to eerie to uh, Adolf Hitler in some of the speeches they were giving, right? But people are somehow embracing uh, that concept right now. 80 years from 1942 was the Civil, uh, the civil War in America. And you go back there, you hear the rhetoric about why they're fighting, same issues we're dealing with right now. And if you, and if, uh, if you go back 80, uh, 80 to 90 years before that was the American Revolution. Same concepts there. The, the, the punchline there is says that there are, between that time, people in 1942, majority of them started to pass away. So people have forgotten what the issues are or never really learned or understood it to a depth they needed to understand it to influence it. As a result, we are now about to address the same thing, the same things. Right now, we have no idea how to solve these gridlock we're dealing with right now. The, uh, the global economy and climate change and homelessness and economic divide, we don't know, and there's Congress, you can see, is, there's, no, there's no movement. So what can we learn from 1942 that can change this? And I guess the, my point is, what other agency is gonna make that correction? What other agency? If we're not around to actually teach what is, needs to be taught, and we've done a poor job of doing that, right? We're burning books right now. They were burning books in, in Italy um, uh, in 19, uh, with Mussolini, and you just kind of look at what's happening right now, and it is scary <laughs> compared, and just it, compared to what happened in 1942 and beyond that. So I guess the, the punchline here is, if we don't do it as educator, who's, who's gonna do it? That's it. And uh, so uh, that's, that's why we can't leave. <coughs> So, so I'd like to chime in and share this. If I could get, I've always wanted to serve and have had the honor of serving in needy communities uh, because I've always wanted to serve um, in communities with high English language learners because that, that, that's, that was me, you know, growing up in the Bronx. Um, and, you know, and children who, you know, are very needy because that was me growing up in the Bronx, you know? And uh, if I could give a winning lottery ticket to every family that I serve, to every child that I've served, I'd be very happy. But because I cannot do that, the next best thing that I really feel that I, I have always felt that I could give to my families and my children, my students, is a good education. That education was my ticket out of a life of poverty. You know, that education that I received has given me the opportunity to sit here today, you know, with a doctorate degree and talk to you all. What an honor that is. You know, I could not have achieved that without my public education. And I struggled. I struggled and that was okay, but I still got here, you know, and every child deserves that. And being in these positions of leadership, as hard as it is, I, as, as Paul said, it's, it's, not, it's not a job, it's a calling, it's a mission, it's a voice you hear, it's a fire that you have in your belly um, that is always there. And it is a unique, unique, God-given opportunity to be able to serve and contribute to the future of a lot of children and families. And that could never, ever go under, underestimated in any way. 
<clears throat> How about you, Dan? What do you want to add? You've been at this probably longer than anybody on this set in this panel. Um, what would you say to prospective uh, leaders out there about why it's worth it to still do it? Why it's worth it? I've, uh, I've done it for 55 years. I started out as a New York City teacher when I was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it begins with why you became a teacher in the first place. That's it. And why you became a principal and why you did all of these things. And you become a su superintendent is not for the weak of heart. Superintendent is not for anyone that lacks courage. Because by that point, you realize the impact that you have on the lives of people. As a classroom teacher, we impacted the lives of whatever number of kids we had in our class. And I'm sure all of us. I still have kids that were in my classes that write to me, and they're now grandparents telling me, you know. Uh, but as, as a superintendent, the impact that you have on thousands of kids is like no other job. Yep. And that is the reward that you have. But you can only do that when the, you have the conviction to do what is the right thing to do. Anybody that takes a superintendency because it's the job and it's the pay, they're not going to last. They're not, right now I can tell you that these boards of education that fired their superintendents that had the conviction to do the right thing and they went out and they hired somebody else, they're already firing those people too. They're firing them already, superintendents that have been on the job one or two years, why? Because those individuals took the job because they thought they were gonna help with the burning of the books and help with all these things and all of a sudden they realized, wait a minute, that's not what I'm about. So it's about your conviction, your leadership and understanding the reward of the job is the impact that you have on the lives of thousands of kids, and that's the reason to do it. And if anybody here who's looking at the superintendent doesn't have that, don't do it. It's not worth it. That's right. I have to say, it's, it's inspiring to just listen to all of you and just motivating, especially. I, we've been talking about this a lot, especially at the beginning of the year. Just like the difference, at, you know, one could argue last year was the most difficult school year. For folks that have been in the system for decades, saying that for many reasons, that it was the toughest. So just your enthusiasm, your perspective is, is, very, is greatly appreciated. Switching gears a little bit, as, as Maria talked to us at, in the introduction, you know, one of the underlying themes is radical change or innovation, some of this out of necessity over the last number of years. But we also get, and all of you gave examples of how you've pushed the needle, how you, you, know, you pushed against the systems, but that's not always easy, especially for new leaders, right? We heard some of the examples Dan gave in, in really thinking about things outside the box. You know, he had some of the luxury of having that cachet, putting in those time in, in those districts. I, I worked for Ray Cortinas, like a number of people in this room, and I remember him telling the board, hey, if you don't listen to me, I'm just going to leave. But that's the luxury of him being 86 years old and <laughs> on his third stand as superintendent. And wearing right? his, his impeccable white shirt. <laughs> Not everybody shirt. has that luxury. So what advice do you give to leaders, to aspiring superintendents that really want to come in and really push the envelope, who want to innovate, who want to think outside the box, but it's, it's hard. It's not the safe thing to do. You all have to work with boards. Dan talked about the number, the turnover that we see in, in districts. So what advice would you give? Anybody who wants to jump in first. Yeah, I, I have to highlight Ben here because I think something he said was really powerful as a strategy to be able to go in and bring innovation and bring change. He brought his community in. Mm -hmm. And that is really important uh, in the superintendency because there is no way today that I believe we can achieve half of what we even want to achieve if we don't bring them in. I think about you know this you know CRT stuff that <laughs> Tan alluded to. You know, before we have kept parents as much as possible outside of the classroom. You know, but I think we're approaching a time where we're going to have to invite them in and allow them to see that we're not doing the things that they're hearing out there and we're not teaching the things that, they're, that they think we're teaching in the classroom. That some of the curriculum that has been proposed to them that we are doing in the classroom does not really exist at all. And somehow we're going to have to build that type of credibility again uh, with the public and with parents so that they believe in what we are doing. We cannot be a mystery. 
but I, there's a lot of wisdom and strategies like what Ben has shared in a very difficult community. He brought them in in order to achieve change. And I think the power that we have in being able to achieve these things is the power that exists in community, is the power that exists in people to rally behind you and to do things together. I think that's the only way that today we can bring about change and innovation. Yeah. All right. All right, so I, I have to warn, we only have four minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. Yeah. Give us good thoughts, but short thoughts. Uh, and then we're going <laughs> to open people up. Sorry, Ben. I totally concur uh, uh, here. In, uh, I think they're, they're, don't under, what you, the parents in the community knows what's good. Right, so so mm -hmm. I, you know, in Santa Monica, Malibu, I had them adopt what we call the American Cultural Ethnic Studies grad requirement, starting with class of 2024, in which we we I told them we got to decolonize the curriculum. Okay, we're not going to have this extra curriculum of ethnic Chicano studies, or Black studies, or LGBTQ studies. We're going to take what those courses would have done. We're going to embed it in English. We're going to embed it in U.S. history. We're going to embed it in math. And our and when we brought the staff in and said this is what we, they were just, they were ecstatic. They were ecstatic. And when we, and we bring in the parents in to explain what you're trying to do, they, they, get, they get ecstatic. So I was able to use that to then say, that, that this can't be about just us reading books or anything. It's, got, it's about, about service learning and, and project-based learning and so, so forth. So I took a bunch of my parents, teachers, to all kinds of places. We went to, we went to high tech high, we went to some of the programs, great programs we have in Santa Barbara, where, uh, in, where, I, where I used to be, uh, where I was at assistant soup. They have some great project-based learning concepts there. And in Fresno, where I was, uh, where I was a principal, at a place called CARP, where, where these kids are cloning strawberries and doing just all kinds of different things. So when they, when they came back, they're like, why can't we do that? I said, well, we need some bond money. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up passing $700, $785 million school bond. And when you go to Malibu and Santa Monica right now, you will see the schools are just being di dismantled to rebuild, to e erect up uh, schools that, that serve as classrooms, that serve as instructional tools that we can use uh, for this work. So, so uh, you're right. Inviting them in and actually t showing them a vision for the 21st century, they get it. And they'll definitely, they'll definitely help you. Get Paul, you, you have a time to get final word. Uh, oh, I, I don't want the final word. But uh, <laughs> I just to, to add to this, one of the most profound, that we're, we've been highlighted across the state and country for our guidance in COVID. I think the most impactful document and, and, and guidance we've provided is through uh, Jeanette's shop again in the, in the equity blueprint. And I, we spent three years listening to our communities, lifting up the voice of our marginalized populations, our African-American community, teachers, parents, kids, professors, community members, bringing all our folks together, Latinx community, and we have 18 federally recognized tribes, so our indigenous folks, building out, you know, indigenizing the classroom. Um, but the term that, I, that I'll refer to for, for our aspiring leaders is socially conscious leadership. And, and so much of, of what's been trained in, in traditional practices is the superintendent being in charge. I, it requires humility to be vulnerable, to be not have the answers. Some of the best work I've done in, in my career has come, the answers don't reside within Paul. They're in the community. What are the aspirations, needs, and desires, hopes, and dreams? Packaging that up and responding to it and co-constructing with them. That, that is the key. Our goal in San Diego County that we've been tugging on for three months, we're finally solidifying it, Lower the number of kids who qualify for free and reduced funds from 50% to 35 over the next five years. And I have zero control over this, and I don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. But think about this for a second. The marker for free and reduced lunch, $35,000 or less for a family of four on average. Tell me if that's fair, right, true, or just. And as the income disparity grows, as Ben said, our opportunity, is, even if we stop that, it continues to grow. And I'm not necessarily, if I use the term poverty, I'm not going to tell someone what poverty is. I didn't know we were poor until I went to school. And for some of our kids and families, poverty has nothing to do with material things or money. I love John Powell's frame around poverty through the, through the lens of belongingness. 
in the social, economic, political, what is the participation? What is that circle and compassion pair that everybody gets to participate in, not be left behind where the voice is silenced? We have a unique opportunity to bring those voices up and do some pretty amazing work. So we have two mics out there, and we have some time for some audience participation. So please step up if you'd like to ask a question or if you have a short comment. I see the county superintendent, the current county superintendent, Deborah Duardo. Thank you for coming, Deborah. <laughs> such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I, my comment is to say thank you, to express the gratitude. So many strong leaders in this room that have gone through a very difficult time. And in LA County with 80 school districts, we saw over 30% of turnover in the superintendents. And talking, and you, when you drill down to schools and districts, it's even higher than that. So we have a lot of work to do, and I'm just really excited to be here and hear from all of you and learn from all of you. Wanted to congratulate Dr. Ott. Uh, Dr. Robles is here, so in a room full of incredible people, just a lot of thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks. So I'm a product of the San Diego Unified School District, so yay. <laughs> So you all speak of a lot of challenges. Can you maybe give us a few things that give you hope? I, our young people, yeah. our young people want to be a part of something special. They want to work for, for purpose. And for us, even before the pandemic, a result of that equity blueprint, our kids said they want to see themselves in the classroom in our schools. So we put together a program countywide uh, any kid in our underserved communities, black, Latinx, indigenous, I mean, basically, long story short, your entire education is free through the community college, national, and now I know USC is doing something similar. So we have cohorts of high school kids that are coming through the ranks that are hungry, that um, have opinions, and are just our beautiful kids and having the opportunity to, to, to reinvest. You, we're just saying, hey, give us three years in the community you serve, but your, your undergrad teaching credential, you're not gonna walk out with a dollar of student debt. And we have tons of kids lined up for this program. Um, the future is bright with our young people. They are looking at the adults going, what the heck yeah. is going on? Yeah. Yeah. Our children are beautiful, they're hungry, and we're gonna, we're gonna provide the opportunity for them. I totally concur with Paul. Uh, that is what inspires me. Uh, you, know, you know, as we talk about racism and all this discrimination, it, it's usually the student's voice that, that really uh, that gets people to start changing their minds. And they're vocal about it. And to hear them say they're a lot more sophisticated than even the adults. So, so they're doing a good job. So I, I, I'm inspired by them. Yeah, our children are our future. And that's easy to say because they are. <laughs> And so that's why education is so important, because we have the opportunity as children to begin to mold and shape their attitudes and their beliefs and their thinking. And right now, they're ready for that. Yeah. So they, they're our hope, and that's why it's so important that we regain uh, the, the ability to provide all of our kids with the kind of education that we need them to have in order for them to realize the future that we all foresee. Cool. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is John. I, I work at USC at uh, Rossier Center Edge, which we focus on uh, developing uh, partnerships that seek to, you know, find innovative solutions uh, in educational uh, engagement. Um, and today, you know, we, we heard a lot about um, social emotional learning and how to embed, you know, career into the high school curriculum and different ways to go away from the traditional academic calendar. Um, and as you were talking about that, I was uh, reminded about continuation schools, uh, which on the one hand, they're really great because they really transform lives for students who benefit from, from it uh, and the resources that, that they're offered. But on the other hand, a lot of non-continuation schools view them as dumping grounds um, for students who uh, they don't know what to do with or how to help, right? So I was just curious to hear more about your views on continuation schools. If you have any in your districts, how does your district work to prevent the misplacement of students into continuation schools, but also how do you work to celebrate their successes? 
in our district, we do have a continuation school that's pretty small. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't expel many students. Uh, the, the way I look at it is uh, it's an engagement issue. And I, a lot of times you, you, track, you track these issues way back in elementary. And, uh, and I, it, 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 but, but if the curriculum isn't resonating with the students and they're not seeing the benefit of it or anything like that, uh, it, it, yeah, they're, they're going to they're get disconnected. And that, it's a lot of those students that end up in my, in, in my continuation schools. Uh, but what we've done is I've actually moved them to the college, and I, I'm establishing what we call a middle college type kind of concept in which they're able to get their AA degree as well as uh, take advantage of some of the project-based learning concepts they have at the uh, cert certification programs they have at the, at the, at the SMC. Uh, so uh, when you talk to these kids, they know a lot. It, uh, it's just they, they might not subscribe to the traditional approach of learning or, or anything like that, so you have to... You have to take where they are and recognize they all have, we all have assets, yeah. and you have to approach things in a more of an asset-based model instead of a deficit-based yeah. uh, deficit, uh, model. So you know, to me, that's, that's, that's the only way to approach that. I, I think if we're successful with our programming, we won't have a continuation. We'll just have a different path of, uh, of, of students learning and I want to learn in a different way. There's an interesting tension with this, because I, I taught in the programs. And that's how I fell in love with education. And um, no program should be done. But, but here's the, here's the inter interesting piece. Our office is funded, ADA, through expulsion or kids being incarcerated. That's how we get a lot of our money and budget. And so I've actually invested the last five years in a restorative practices team that goes out to prevent mm -hmm. expulsions working with the DA to reduce incarceration, but setting up achievement centers. But we're talking about children. Expectations are no different in our schools than they are in a traditional district. In fact, even the kids who are incarcerated are taking college classes online through our, our network and, and concurrently enrolled. Our, our expectation, we want to expose them to everything, make sure they have choices upon graduation. So, the, it, it all comes down to expectations of our children. You know what our innovation team lives and breathes by? Eliminate bias and create opportunity. It has nothing to do with technology. Mm -hmm. But think about that. Is every child getting what they need and deserve every minute of every day? And our kids don't see in our programs more than one or two teachers for the entire day or classes. We slowed it down. The relationships are more important, and they're thriving academically now. Blowing up that six-period thing is something I am a huge fan of. Doesn't work. Thank you. But I also have to add one thing that may not be a very popular thing to say, and it's that um, there unfortunately is a reality and a vicious um, cycle of placing principals and leaders that shouldn't be leading in schools like continuation high schools. Yeah, we don't do it that. becomes a dumping ground uh, for, for the adults as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to re-examine our commitment to the most neediest of the needy. Yeah. Uh, because if ever there is a need for innovation in any circle, it's in a continuation high school. Yeah. But it cannot be a dumping ground for principals that may um, may have never received the support and direction that they needed to become good principals. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Nina Hoffman. Um, I have a question to the panel about mental health. Um, I think that through the pandemic, mental health has been a huge problem. And I don't think that um, our hospitals and caregivers and people really know how to deal with mental health. I sadly lost my oldest child almost two years ago in this space. So I'd like to hear from you guys and your positions, like what you're doing for training, what kind of resources do you have? Um, I'm just like a really big believer that this is something that needs to be discussed and something that the resources need to be made available to these children. Thank you. Yeah, you're, uh, well, first, so sorry for your loss. Um, you know, 
traditionally and what we're doing in San Diego County that's very new and different. It's a model that I took from our previous district where we built a consortium of 36 health agencies. Um, 8,000 kids in our district had never even seen a primary care physician. So we built private and public money, built a community health center for all of our students. Um, so every child had access to health care, but also a, a universal screening process and uh, a method in which kids got paired up with services, not based upon adults' perception of the child. So that's what happens a lot of time when some of our kids act up in their referral. Um, a lot of our kids are suff suffering in silence. So what we're building in San Diego County for, for all of our schools is a universal screening process on a regular basis that's basically triaged where there's uh, a light touch support, there's uh, secondary support, and then there's, there's the uh, follow-up um, with it, if it's intense services that are needed. And this gives us at least the best shot at being, having some continuity across the whole county where everyone's fluid in that system and there's a place to be referred. Now, the, the money, fortunately, the money keeps coming and there's such a shortage now of, of mental health therapists, just like we're seeing in the teaching profession, that we've built now a cohort that I described earlier for our future teachers, for future mental health therapists on our, on our campus. Um, but the goal for us is to catch the kids. I mean, everything that we're seeing in our schools and how those things have tr been traditionally held is reactionary and, and just being able to get in front of it. And, and those early indicators are crucial. That's going to be part and parcel of what we do in our county for every single school. And you know, if we educate, um, if we provide the professional development for teachers on trauma-informed practices, we can reach all students. And I think that those trauma-informed practices are critical today, uh, especially today, not forgetting our teachers and staff members as well. If you have ever experienced trauma in your life, until you experience trauma, you don't realize that you cannot learn, you cannot function, you cannot sit through a meeting in trauma and absorb anything that's being said. So how can we expect children to learn algebra, to learn geometry, to learn chemistry, if their minds are in trauma as well. So I think we've gotten to a point with mental health where these things are happening because of the need. But reaching all students today, having those trauma-informed practices as part of a credentialing program for teachers today has to be um, available. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I mean, I think it's something that really needs to be discussed and people need to be more aware. Just, just to add to what the, 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 what's been said already, um, the, the, the way I look at it is there's different levels. Like, uh, you know, you guys are all familiar with the tier levels of instruction, tier one, tier two, tier three. But the, the focus on mental health, I think, uh, I think universally, there has to be a practice that every site does to, 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 to do that check for social emotional learning and so on. So in our district, for example, we use restorative justice circles. Uh, I would say about 75% of teachers are using it right now. We got to get more the rest to get on board with that. But to have that practice in place to, for that mental check-in, emotional check-in uh, in the classroom is, is, is essential. And then secondly, have a, in a tier two is, if things do pop up, are you ready to uh, support the families with different resources? So uh, and, and Duardo, uh, Dr. Duardo, Deborah Duardo, they, they, uh, we uh, uh, aligned ourselves with the community schools a grant that they gave their district is, is a position that we have there to help us uh, per, uh, to help us organize ourselves enough to know that we have to provide resources to the families. So the issue becomes there's all at least in Santa Monica and Malibu there's all these different resources that we have, but there isn't a central place where somebody can help families access them, mm -hmm. and that position is really helping us do that uh, well. Uh, but I think there needs to be a tier one level, which everybody does, and then you have to have a game plan for that, uh, for that additional support that you need when you do recognize something, uh, something, and then obviously tier three is when you're dealing with huge issues, you know, um, like such as schizophrenia and those things, 
uh, uh, that, that we need we need support for those as well. So that's a, I would say that's a probably a tier three, tier three support. Okay, hey, we're going to take one last question and um, then transition to the reception. So, final question. Yes, I just have a comment. My name's Laura, and I'm uh, going into my third year as a principal of a small elementary school in Capistrano Unified School District. And a problem that I've seen as I've started the principalship is a mindset shift needs to take place for leaders and school leaders. And I just think, I, I spoke to a few people before I came in. I didn't know how I ended up here. I had an invitation in my email. <laughs> I responded, and I'm sitting here with all of these incredible inspiring people wondering how did I get here, but I don't think things happen on accident. So um, I just, this, these types of conversations need to happen with our, our newer leaders and our young principals because hearing what you have to say really put, lights the fire in me to you know, create systematic change not only in my school but for my district. So thank you so much for sharing. Well, I am very um, overwhelmed by the, the quality of ideas that you've put forth that I think all of you can take back and apply and, and think about, reflect on um, in your own roles, your various re leadership roles. Uh, please join me in giving a really warm uh, Trojan appreciation to our panel. Um, And join me in, again, acknowledging Dan Dominich for his leadership role over 15 years on the national level. Dan, thank you for taking the trip out here and getting to know our wonderful university and beautiful campus. Um, I want to thank our two facilitators for asking some probing questions. Dean and Edgar, thank you. So the privilege for me was to be able to introduce you to uh, the Malbo legacy. And I hope you will be watching in the future for other conversations that will take place um, under that legacy that uh, really the through line from a vision long ago to where we are today and to where we aspire to be in the future. I'm so, so grateful to all of you for coming. We do have a reception now. There's um, something to eat and something to drink for all of you. But there's a tradition uh, at Ross here and at, that we're proud of, and that is the networking, the helping each other, supporting each other with ideas, with solving problems, supporting each other so that we can advance and have a greater impact on the young people that need all of us um, to get to where they um, aspire to be. So with that, thank you for being here. Enjoy the reception. We look forward to getting to know you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you, everyone.